stick around until you get started. Okay. I think we're waiting on a couple other people, right? Yeah. There's still a couple minutes before one. Yeah. In fact, I'll go ahead. Okay. So, uh, would you turn her up the yeah. tab, please? There we go. Go ahead and talk, Jessica. Is that better? Can you hear me better? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. I'm going to make sure that, yeah, my, okay. my microphone is. Sometimes it's because I have my microphone set as my webcam, but sometimes it switches over to my headphones, and then if I don't have my headphones in, it's far away. So I just wanted to make sure it was set up. I think it's good. Um, well, welcome everyone. My name is Jessica Gake. I'm an instructional designer with Sight. Um, I was <laughs> at NKU um, for about a year and a half, and then my husband and I moved back to Phoenix, Arizona, which is where we're from. He got a job out here, and where our family is here, so it's kind of a no-brainer for us to move back. But I talked to Tommy and Jeff and just said, I understand if that means I need to give my notice or I'm willing to work remotely. And so we're kind of doing a trial of having me work remotely. And I've been offering these trainings um, online as well as in this kind of in-person format, but I'm <laughs> remote. Um, and then, you know, still just working with faculty, but we do these Zoom sessions and it actually works great because we can share screens and um, so it's been, it's been actually even better than I thought it would be. Um, the transition's been really good, but, um, you know, all these trainings, we needed to keep giving them. So that's why I'm still giving them, even though I'm remote, um, which if there's technical difficulties, you know, I'll jump back on or let Tommy know and he'll come in and, um, help out as needed. But, um, thanks for being here today. And I know that the transition from, Blackboard to Canvas is, you know, it's any transition, any change is going to be difficult and have things that are, you know, things to learn. There's a learning curve. And so I'll do my best to answer any questions. We're basically, this training is an overview of Canvas. Um, so we're going to talk about kind of the global navigation, how to get around Canvas, what are the main global features, um, and then also getting into the course and talking about like the course settings and the main setup of your course. And then we talk about the main differences between Canvas and Blackboard. Um, so that when you're starting to work in Canvas, you have, I found that if you understand how things are different, it's less frustrating <laughs> to work in Canvas when you're used to Blackboard. So, um, you know, as we go, feel free to ask questions. I can hear you just fine. So just go ahead and, you know, talk as if I were in the room. Um, you know, and, and there may be situations where I say, you know, answer your question, but then explain that it's covered more in detail in another training, because this training is very general. We talk about a lot of stuff kind of an inch deep and a mile wide, and you'll hear me say a lot, this is covered mo in more detail in another training. So I do try to give you an overview of everything. And I do try to highlight the important things like, hey, this is different than Blackboard, or hey, you need to know this, but I don't cover everything in depth. So um, if there's anything that you do have questions about, feel free to ask. Um, and we'll try to just keep it running so that we, you know, don't run out of time at the end. But so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. And we'll just jump right into the training here. Um, let me grab that screen share. OK. And I do have a PowerPoint, but we're not in the PowerPoint very often. What, what is happening? There we go. Okay, so the topics, I already kind of explained this. So the topics are kind of the main Canvas navigation, but then also the course navigation and how to get around in the course. I will show you a couple examples of how some people have organized their courses in Canvas. I feel like that's helpful to see how other people have designed their courses in Canvas. And then we talk about the main differences between Canvas and Blackboard and things you need to know as you start working in Canvas. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is the global navigation. So we're just going to jump right back over to Canvas. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Yeah. And then where is my video feed? Am I over on the right-hand side of the screen or am I somewhere else? The right corner. Up there. Okay, so what I'll do is anytime I'm showing you something in this direction, I will make the screen a little smaller so you can see everything. So if I forget to do that, just let me know. Hey, you're in the way. <laughs> um, so when you first log, does everyone know how to log into Canvas, first of all? Um, you know, just in case anyone's not sure, if you go to nku.edu and you go to the quick links and go to Blackboard Canvas, 
um, the Canvas logo is right here. You click on that and you will see Canvas will log in. <laughs> and you may have to log in with your NKU credentials. Um, <coughs> But you know, once you do, you'll see your dashboard, which is the main landing page for Canvas. <clears throat> um, eventually, I think the Learn Online link will be connected to Canvas, but for now, um, it's nku.instructure.com. Instructure is the, the name of the company that produced Canvas. So Canvas is the product, Instructure is the company. Um, but eventually our Learn Online, um, link will redirect to Canvas, but for now it's still on Blackboard. Um, the dashboard is the main landing page for Canvas. You'll notice when you first log in that you have these cards that represent each of your classes. We're going to talk about the cards in detail in just a minute. Um, you'll also see, I know I'm blocking it, but we'll, I'll, I'll minimize it when, when we get to this, the to-do list and the coming up menu, which we'll talk about. Um, and then you also have some notifications at the top. You may have notifications. The notifications at the top are global notifications. So for example, these ones that I have right now are invitation to some courses that I'm gonna be working on. I just haven't accepted them yet because I wanna wait until I'm ready to work on them to accept them. Um, and so that's what these green outlined notifications are for, are these course invitations. When you're added to a course through our system, through SAP, you won't see the green notifications. It, um, they will just be on your dashboard. You don't have to accept invitations to those. The, the, the ones that you'll have to accept invitations for are any that like, if you are working with another instructor and they add you to their course so that you can see what they're doing, then you would have to accept the invitation. Um, you may also see some global um, notifications from put, push through about like enrollment or um, you know registering for classes or online um, the online surveys and stuff at the end of the semester so if you see those they're usually outlined in black and they look very similar but um, instead of just being an accept button there's an X in the top right corner and you can close those once you've read them. So if you have a bunch of those notifications kind of filling up your screen, you, you can read through them and then dismiss them and they'll go away until there's another new notification. Those don't get sent out very often, um, but we, when they do, they're perpetual. They stay there until you do something with them. So you wanna make sure that you clear those out so that they're not you know, bogging down your dashboard screen. Um, was that Robin that just joined us? Hi, hey, Robin. <laughs> um, I was telling that I was going to give you a hard time if you didn't show up because you've been telling me all year you were going to come to a training. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> anyways, um, okay. So the so those are the notifications up here at the top. Um, the dashboard itself here, you should see the card view is kind of the default view. There's a few other things that you can see over, if you go to the right of this dashboard and the three dots here, um, there's the card view, which is what's the default. And then there's the recent activity view. And then there's the color overlay, which is I think by default turned on. And the color overlay basically, an instructor can put an image on the dashboard card. Um, and so, the color overlay just makes a transparent version of the color, the card color over the image. This is, the color is set by the user, the image is set by the instructor. So the color overlay is set by the user. So I could change this one and change it to green and that's not gonna affect anyone else in the course except for me. It's just for me to know that I've chosen green as the color for this course. Now, if I turn that off that by clicking the three dots and then deselecting the color overlay option, that just takes the transparent color that's over the images and makes it like a little opaque circle in the top right corner of the card. And the reason for the color is just a little bit of added differentiation. So you'll see the colors in the calendar. You're going to see it on the course list. It's not important enough, you know, if someone is colorblind, it's not going to make a big difference because it's not super important with the colors, but it is just helpful if for those people who are very visual, um, you know, and they have that color, 
they want those color codes and you know have everything kind of synced by color they can do that but it's not necessarily a necessity um, the other view for the dashboard so this is the card view and each course gets a card but there's one other view that you can toggle back and forth between is the recent activity view and this is just going to give you all of your notifications in one place. So if you would rather see all of your new messages in one little section, all of your assignment notifications, discussions, announcements, any notifications of recent activity in the courses are going to show up, but they're combined. So some people prefer this and other people want to see it kind of by course. And you'll see that each course card has these same icons of recent activity. So it's up to you how you use it. You, some people only use the card view, some people prefer the recent activity view, and some people go back and forth. Totally up to you, it's based on the user, um, but the, the cards are gonna be most helpful for instructors and students because they can jump right into a specific course from here. Um, the recent activity icons are just showing recent activity in the courses, um, you'll see these little bubbles with the numbers referring to like how many new items there are in those uh, fields. But you'll also, when you log into the course, see the same kind of notices. So um, there's a lot of places where you'll get notified of these recent activity things. So You'll notice that each card has the name of the course. We'll use this one as an example. And then the course ID underneath it and the term underneath that. The name of the course is the main, uh, field, I guess that, that is displayed throughout canvas, which is, can be problematic because if you're an instructor who teaches two sections of the same course in certain menus it's difficult to tell the difference for example on this courses list here if i click on this i don't see the section number i only see the name of the course so when we get to the course settings i'm going to show you how to actually edit the name of the course so that you can add the section number to the name of the course instead of only having it in the course id and that way you can tell the difference between two courses that have the same name. Um, but it, no matter where you click on the card, it's going to take you into the course. And then if you click on any of the recent activity icons, it'll take you to that section of the course. So if it's if you click on the announcement notification icon, it's going to take me into the announcements page. If you click on the discussion icon, it's going to take me to the discussions page. But if I click anywhere else, it's going to take me to the home page, the landing page for the course. Are there any questions about the dashboard so far? Okay. Um, you'll notice that, well, you may not notice this. <laughs> I have a lot of courses on my dashboard, but it's actually not even all of my courses. So the courses that are on my dashboard are actually my favorited courses. Um, and I need to go through and clean them up because I have way, way too many that are favorited right now. Um, but basically, by default, all of your courses are going to display on the dashboard. But you can select favorites to only appear on the dashboard. And the way to do that is if you go to courses on the far left menu, it, it brings up this, this list here, which is actually the same as the ones on the dashboard. So this is another kind of quick access menu here and <clears throat> the benefit to this is that um there's they don't it takes it's a lot quicker to load this menu because there's no images there's no notifications so if you're jumping from one course to another and you just want to do it quickly you can click the courses tab here and just jump right to it so that's why they're the same courses as your dashboard but if you scroll all the way down, you'll see this link called All Courses. And you're going to go ahead and click on that. And then in the All Courses page, you will see a master list of all of your courses. So you're going to see the course color that you chose on the dashboard, the name of the course. Again, this is another place where you're not seeing a section number or the course ID. So this is another place where it's beneficial to have the section number added to the course name, which again, I'll show you when we get to the settings, how to do that. 
Um, if you've added a nickname on the course itself, uh, which is going to be most helpful for students, but it will show here the term that it's in. A lot of these are development courses, which, but if I scroll down, you'll see more that have like the term. How you're enrolled. So if you're a student or a teacher or a designer, and then whether or not the course is published is going to show up on this far right column. Publishing is Canvas's terminology for making it available. So just like in Blackboard, you have to make the course available. In Canvas, you have to publish the course. And just like in Blackboard, you have to make each item available. You have to publish each individual item in Canvas. So it's your way of controlling what students see and don't see, or what's available to the course. <clears throat> then on the far left, you see these stars on the far left. And you'll notice that I have a few that are selected as orange. This is how you favorite your courses in order for them to show up on the dashboard. So as I said before, by default, none of them are favorited and all of them show up on the dashboard. Once you select a few favorites, those are the ones that will show up on the dashboard. So the orange ones are gonna show up on the dashboard and um, you can just go ahead and click one to make it unfavorited. And then you can also click another, you know, you can click a star to make it orange, which will make it a favorite. So what's nice about this is that you can just have just the courses you're currently teaching on the dashboard, but you can still access all of your courses. You just, you know, it helps keep things kind of clean and organized. By default, when you're added to a new course, so for example, when the fall courses, I think fall is already published. So when spring courses roll around and they get pushed out, those will actually show up on your dashboard. Um, but you can come in here and deselect them as favorites so that they can not show up or re-favorite them if you want. Robin, did you have a question? I do. So can you uh, order from this page or is that somewhere else or did I come in late and miss that? Oh, no, that's fine. Um, unfortunately, no, this page is not for some reason. I don't really understand different categories, but they're not sortable by. They're in alphabetical order, but then there's also two other categories, which are past enrollments and future enrollments. Um, so that has to do with the date that you have set in your course, which we'll talk about later. Um, but on the dashboard, they're in alphabetical order. So, and you can't, there is a plugin that you can download for your web browser where you can rearrange them. Um, but it's not like a built in feature of Canvas to be able to rearrange the okay. dashboard cards. Okay. Yeah. I have a question about the all courses. Yep. That whole list, that seems to have been transferred over from Blackboard, the things we had last up on Blackboard. Is that correct? There are all of your courses from. I think since fall 2017 was the earliest, but they're not, they're not duplicates of your Blackboard. They're, so your content from Blackboard won't be there. It's just a shell from Canvas because we started pushing out Canvas course, courses of, for all the courses at that point. So we can transfer material from the Blackboard courses into these uh, if we wish to, right? You can, yeah, you can absolutely use those as shells. Um, for kind of storing your courses. courses were merged, you know, so there are three titles and one is the merge that has the two together. Right. So do I just dump the merged one over into one box on the side? Of, you know, I, I don't want to keep all those shells active, I guess. So, you know, in trying to, I, I guess it's easy to have material and also the email list for classes as long as they're active. Are, are those are there other reasons to transfer or not to from Blackboard? Well, your student, so your student roster will be there because it's the same course. So yes, yeah, so communication will be available if you make the course published. Um, but as far as like bringing Blackboard student work over, that won't transfer over. Only your content will come over. Okay. So, so really the benefit is just to have it as like a storage for that course until you use it again in Canvas. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter which course you use. Like, if you have two sections plus a merge shell, you can just choose one of them to use um, as, like, your storage. It doesn't, it's not going to affect one way or, or the other. And 
Did I answer your question? Will those email lists be active then um, if I want to use them? They uh, will be. They will be. Um, you, you would have to publish the course to communicate with students through Canvas. Though. That's the way to go about doing that. If I right. Want to. Okay. Yeah. And I will show you how to do that when we get to that section. So, um, any other questions? Okay. I forgot to show you one thing on the dashboard to change the. Well, I did. I showed you you can change the color by clicking the three dots on each card. You can also change the nickname of the course. But again, um, this is. I don't think this really helps you. I mean, it changes. Okay, so let me change my sandbox course really quick. Since let me change my nickname. Let's just try. So it changes it on the card, but like on my courses menu, it still says the name, the real name of my course. Uh, I think. Let me just refresh the page and make sure. Because I'm just now I'm curious to make sure. Oh, I guess you, okay, so you could, but I, see, this is where you could add the nickname instead of changing the name of the course, but I think there are some menus where the nickname doesn't appear, it's, it's weird how kind of like certain menus will change based on the nickname and other menus won't, so in my opinion, it's better to just, if you want to be able to differentiate between two sections, it's better to just change. Like if you're going to course copy in the future, I think that's one of the menus that won't update based on the nickname. So you, like you're going to want to be able to tell which section is which if you're going to do a course copy from one of them. So in my opinion, it's better to just change the name of the course, but I'll show you how to do that when we get to that point. Um, okay, let me, the to-do list and the coming up menu on the dashboard here. So the to-do list is basically a to-do list. It's going to show you as the instructor what you need to do to grade things. Um, you'll, you'll notice that some of my notifications are from February because they're not courses that I'm actually teaching. So these notifications have just stayed there, even though these things have been graded by the instructor. So it's one of those things where you need to, if you're gonna use it, you wanna keep up with it, but then if you're keeping up with it, it's super helpful. If you don't keep up with it, you know, it, it will just kind of keep the notifications there and you'll have to eventually go through and clear them out. But you. What's nice is you can clear it out and then if the item will reappear if there's a new submission. So let's say you get, let's say this isn't from February, this is actually from like today. And it shows me that there are three new submissions for this assignment that haven't been graded. If I close it out, then it will reappear when another new submission comes up. So it's going to keep telling you, hey, now you have five to grade. Hey, now you have seven to grade. And then when it's, when it gets to a point where you feel like it's worth going in, and actually grading them, you can click on that and it will take you into the speed grader for that, pro for that assignment. For students, they see instead of what they need to grade, they see what they need to turn in or complete. And so again, this is going to be a perpetual notification here until they either click on it to do it or click the X to get rid of it. So what's nice though is that if, if they have a late assignment, that late assignment is going to stay here until they're done with it as long as they don't close it out. If they exit out, it's gone. <laughs> but, um, so this is a really um, helpful tool. We've found that students actually rely quite heavily on this to-do list. And so it's important for you as an instructor to understand what makes things appear here. Basically, if you add a due date, this event um, to anything, it's gonna show up on the to-do list. So I had an instructor that I was working with where they, she had an external tool where the students were doing a lot of the work on the external tool. And at midterms, she brought over kind of the points, point total to date and you know added it to her grade book. And she added the due date of like when she brought points over. Well, she, she labeled the assignment midterm and it was worth like 360 points. And she had the due date. Well, she started getting student emails, students freaking out, thinking there was this midterm they didn't know about that's worth like hundreds of points because it was showing up on their to-do list. Well, little did she know, you know, they didn't realize that that was just a grade book column. So it's something important for you to understand that if you add a due date to something, it is going to populate to the to-do list, which is great if you want it to. <laughs> If you don't want it to populate to do to, for the to-do list, like if it is just a grade book column that you don't really need students to do anything for, they've already completed it or it's a participation score, 
you might not want to add a due date or you want to make sure the name is really clear that it's not something they need to do. It's just for grading. Then that way, when it shows up on the to-do list, it's clear. Um, down here in the coming up menu, this is basically just a rolling, instead of a to-do list, it's just what's coming up in the next seven days. So this is going to be um, just a snapshot for you and for students of what's coming up in the next seven days and it's rolling. So when today rolls off, the next day, seven days from now rolls on. Down here, the recent feedback area <clears throat> is um, where it's, this is going to be mostly helpful for students. They're, if you post a grade, they're going to see their grade, they're going to see any comments you left and they can click on it to see the more expanded version of that feedback. Um, and then if they click, if you click view grades, just for time's sake, I'm not going to do it, but you see an overview of how your classes are doing. So you'll see on app, like you'll see an average. So you'll see, hey, this class has, you know, an 87% for average for 25 students. So it's going to give you kind of an overview of how your class as a whole is doing on average. And then students see their overall grade for all of their classes in one place. So it's just kind of a snapshot. So I think that's everything on the dashboard and we went over the courses already. Any questions before we move on? Okay. The calendar is, um, I love this tool. It's one of my favorite features of Canvas. Um, when I used to teach in Canvas, I relied on it very heavily. Uh, and what's nice about it and what I like about it is that you don't have to do anything. <laughs> it just auto generates from what's already in your course. So if you create an assignment like quiz module two quiz and you give it a due date, it's going to show up on the calendar. So, um, even if it's not an online quiz, like I have a syllabus that lists a bunch of dates, it's going to pull those dates out and plug them in the calendar. No, it's not going to pull it out of a document. This is just okay. if you have an assignment within Canvas. Like if you create content that has a date attached to it in Canvas, then it will populate to the calendar. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how to do that yet. So that's okay. We'll get there. <laughs> so you can put those in as assignments. You can, even if it's something that's done in class, you can create a column in the grade book yeah. for that assignment and give it a, a, a due date. But then you run the problem that you were just saying about Jessica that students might freak, freak out and think that it's something extra or special, you know. When it's you just want to make sure it's clear. Like let's say it is a quiz on the, like a quiz in class, right? And you want it on the calendar and you really do want it on the to-do list because you want them to see, hey, this quiz is coming up. You just make it clear that it's something they're going to take in class. Like in the instructions, this quiz will be taken in class. And then that way, when they click on it from the to-do list, they see it, oh, it's taken in class. I don't need to do anything now, but it's on the calendar and it's on everything else. But you can also add events from the calendar. So if you don't want it to be an assignment where it's attached to a grade or attached to something, content within the class, you can add, like if you have a, a guest speaker in your class and you want them to see it on their calendar, you can add that um, just by itself. Um, what's really nice that I really like is that you can drag things on the calendar and it changes the due date in the class. So let's say you have, you want to give an extension, you want to give them till Monday to complete this quiz one, you can just drag it. I'm not going to do it because this is an actual class, <laughs> um, but you could just drag it on the calendar and it will change the due date in the assignment in your class. So it changes it everywhere, which is so nice because I used to just, you know, if you have to change it on the calendar, then you have to go into the assignment and change the due date there and change, you know, send out an email telling them, you know, you can just change it in one place and it's going to change it everywhere. Now, um, the one caveat to that is if you have, so Canvas, just like in Blackboard, you can set locking dates or availability dates so that like, you know, that a quiz is only available until Friday so that, you know, they, it's due Friday, but then they also can't access it after Friday those dates won't change by dragging it. So for example, for a homework assignment that you don't care if they do it late, you don't have any availability dates set, you can drag things around and it's gonna update perfectly. If you have a quiz or something where you don't want them accessing it after the due date and you set that date, you'll have to go in and manually update that. So it's not a perfect system to like drag things on the calendar. 
Um, it depends on how heavily you rely on availability dates, but it's a nice tool. I think it's helpful. I know students um, use it to be able to see, you know, what's coming up in their, in their courses. There's also a scheduler, so you can actually set appointment times for students um, to sign up for things. So whether you want to do office hours and they can sign up for a time to come meet with you or even in class presentations, you can have them sign up for a time slot right from within Canvas. So that's kind of nice. Um, again, this is something that is covered in another training in the communication training. Jade shows you exactly how to do that. Um, but I like to just kind of give an overview of the calendar. Um, you can pull your calendar from Canvas into your Outlook calendar. It's only one way though. So it's going to bring Canvas into your Outlook. It's not going to bring your Outlook into Canvas. So, um, but if you like to see everything all in one place, you can bring that into your Outlook calendar. Uh, one question. If we um, operate primarily from an old fashioned syllabus, yeah. uh, can we just, uh, you'll be, can we insert it in, in the course itself the way we did in Blackboard? And like a document syllabus? Yeah. Yes. Is that um, something you'll be showing us or? I will. Yeah, when we get to the course, there one of the pages is called syllabus and I'm going to show you how to do that and all okay. that. Um, all right, so that's the calendar. Um, the inbox tool is the messaging system within Canvas. It's actually referred to as conversations in the documentation of Canvas. That's like the tool name. Um, but this is where you know, you can go to check any messages from students within Canvas. I know a lot of people see this and they think, oh no, something else I have to remember to check. But that's not really the case necessarily unless you want to because everything you get here, you will also get an email notification in your Outlook inbox. And so you can actually reply from those email notifications. So like let's say a student emails you within Canvas and then you get the notification in your Outlook you can respond from Outlook and it will reply within Canvas. So you don't have to worry about being on top of this unless you really want to. When I was first teaching in Canvas, I was like, no, don't send me an email in Canvas or send me an email to my, you know, my email address. And then within a semester, I realized that it was actually really nice to have all of my course communication in one place instead of having to like sift through all my emails. But it's, it's a personal preference. You can use it. What's really nice about Canvas is that everything originates from the course. So only the students that are in your course can email you through here. You can organize it by course. So I can look at, okay, this is my sandbox course. Okay, I don't have any messages about this course. And you can really be kind of organized. It organizes it for you, essentially. Uh, Robin, would you? So if I reply in Outlook, does it show up? in the Canvas inbox communication, or if my, I want to be able to have a record of my response. It will, it will do a thread. So you'll be able to see your response from Outlook in your thread in Canvas. Okay. Yeah. The, the only thing that you'll notice is that the notifications you get in your email are just notifications. So they're gonna, so when a student responds to you, you're only going to see their most recent response. You're not going to see the whole thread. So if you wanted to see the whole thread, you'd have to come into Canvas to see that. But you could hypothetically respond each time from Outlook if you wanted to. But to see the whole record and whole thread, you would have to come into Canvas. But, um, but as you can see, I, it looks like I have 108 unread <laughs> messages, but that's not really true because I get emails with all of these. And if they were important, I would have already responded to them. But since I'm not the instructor in these courses, most of them don't apply to me. So I just ignore them. But um, when I was teaching in Canvas, I kept my inbox all, you know, I would, this is where I would come to check student communications. Um, this is also where you can send an email to the whole class. So you were asking, um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name in the back. You were asking about like, if I wanted to send an email to old, the past course students, this is where you would go to do that. Um, the course has to be published in, in Canvas in order for you to send a message to students. So if um, using this like compose message button at the top, you select your course, which would include past courses if you have them in here. And then you'll notice the to field um, you can either start typing a name and it will auto populate based on your course list, or you can click this little contact icon and it gives you options. So you'll see all, 
you'll see teachers. If the course is published, you'll see students, and then you'll see any sections or groups as well. The problem that you heard, that, I guess the thing that I like to bring to your attention in this training is that just because it says all does not mean that that all includes students. So that's where you need to check to make sure if you don't see students as a subcategory, that all does not include students. And the reason is, is the course has to be published for you to communicate with students. And I think that's just like a, a safe, it, it's so, that it's actually like to protect faculty so that like before your course is published, students can't just start messaging you about the course ahead of time. It's like when you publish the course, you're opening it for communication. You're opening it for, you know, students to be able to message you. Now, the downside to that is that if you want to send out an email a week or two ahead of time to let them know what the textbook is and all of that, you have to publish the course, which then is an issue of do I have it ready yet? Um, but I will show you when we get to the course settings how you can publish it but restrict them from viewing it so that even you can have it available for communication but they can't see anything yet. So I'll show you how to do that. But you just want to make sure that before you send a message that you make sure that the student list is populated within the options. Um, so. And then this individual message to each recipient, I always check this when I'm sending group messages. Um, the reason is, is that this doesn't really have anything to do with students seeing each other's responses because they will never see, like if a student, there's no reply all. So if a student, if you send out a message to your whole class, the students can't reply to each other. It's not like an issue of that. But what happens is if, if you don't check this, it threads all of the responses that you receive. So you see one message that you sent, and then you see student one that responded, student two that responded, student three that responded, and let's say you respond to student one, your message then threads down here at the bottom, and you might miss student two because now you're, it's threading all of them in one giant thread. If you send an individual message to each student, then each student as they respond, you're only seeing the threaded message with your response to that student. So it helps you just keep things kind of separate so you're not losing track of student communications. So I always check this box. Um, I wish the default was to have it checked. Unfortunately, it's not. So just, I would highly recommend <laughs> checking that. Because I've made the mistake before of not checking that and then having to dig through like tons of responses to find ones that I hadn't answered yet and it kind of gets messy. Um, okay, that's pretty much the inbox. Are there any other questions about that? Okay. Commons is a sharing repository. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this just for sake of time, but basically you can search for things that other people have shared. I like to use the example of if you're in a write, if you're teaching a writing class or a class that's very writing heavy and your students are expected to know like how to use MLA or APA or whatever your writing style is, but you know that <laughs> it's good to refresh their memory, but you don't want to create a whole unit on that, you know, cause you just like, that's not what I'm teaching, but I want to give them a resource on that. You could use this and search for it and look to see if anyone else has published, oh, here we go, MLA recitation resources, it's a module. So I can maybe pull this into my course as a resource for my students, but I am just borrowing it from someone else that's made it available. So, um, you know, it's kind of one of those things where it could be super useful or you may never use it and that's not gonna be a problem either. Um, some people use it because you can share with just yourself privately. So what's nice is that it syncs updates. So let's say you have three sections of the same course that you're teaching. You could hypothetically have one master course that you're making all the changes in, and then you can share it with just yourself and pull that into every other section. And then when you update any changes, you can sync those changes into your other courses. So you're not having to make changes in all three courses. Robin? So does that mean I can't merge them? No, you can. I'm just saying some people, some people don't like to do that because they'll like have a Monday, Wednesday course and a Tuesday, Thursday uh, course. And then like they want to keep them separate, but essentially they're doing the same assignments in each okay. week. 
Yeah. Um, would this work for a, like a YouTube video you came across and want them all to see before the next class? Is this one way you would do that? Students don't see this. So this is only for instructors to have like share resources with either yourself or other instructors. So okay. if you, if you right. wanted a YouTube video, you would just push, push that into your course. You wouldn't necessarily use this, but. By the way, I'm Bob Wallace in the English department. Okay, Bob, nice to meet you. <laughs> um, okay, I think that's pretty much everything with comments. It's, it's a good tool, um, but it's one of those things where we're not spending a ton of time on it right now just because it's not kind of a, a necessity tool, right? And we want to make sure that we're not bombarding you guys with stuff you don't really need yet. Yeah. Sorry, one more thing. So okay. when I clicked on that, it's, it's, it's requesting access to my account. So I'm assuming I would want to authorize it. Yeah, the first time you use it, you have to authorize it, which is fine. Yeah. It won't ever share anything without you actually sharing it yourself. It's not going to like pull out your stuff or anything like that. Okay, the help menu, I'll just go through this really quick. Students can ask the instructor a question. This allows them to message you from within Canvas. Some people don't like that. They want them to email them. You can't turn this off. Students can message you from within Canvas, period. There's no way to restrict that. What I've tried to focus on <laughs> is it's actually nice because I don't know if you've ever gotten that email from a student where they send it from like their personal account that is like some weird email address that you don't recognize and they just say, need help with assignment and you're like well first of all who are you what class are you in what assignment are you talking about and can you use complete sentences and punctuation please <laughs> right like yeah. this eliminates some of that because when they click this they have to choose a course again everything originates from the course they have to be connected to your course in order to send you a message so by default it's already going to tell you what the, who the student is and what class they're in so at least that <laughs> is the answer for you. Whether or not they use complete sentences and actually tell you what they need is another question, but that helps a little bit, I've found, with that, that issue. Um, searching the Canvas guides is, Canvas um, uses a lot of its own, doc, creates its own documentation on how to use Canvas, so there's a whole repository of helpful, like, articles on how to use canvas so those are called the canvas guides and so if you ever have a question you can always click this and then search like if you want to ask you know how to create multiple choice questions you know you'll find a bunch of resources on how to do that and so you can click that and you know find the one that you want you know and go through there. Now, that's kind of overwhelming because there's so much there. So we actually curated two page help pages, one for students and one for faculty. And so you can even give students the link to this or just tell them that it's there. And pretty much every question students would have about Canvas, like how to submit an assignment, how to take a quiz, how to view their grades, upload their profile picture, those are all linked here. So like the most common the, the things that we think are going to be most common issues or questions from NKU students are going to have help pages linked from here. And then same with faculty. So there's like how to grade something, how to take attendance, how to, um, there's a bunch of different things that we think NKU faculty will want help with. So that's a good starting point for kind of the basics if you have a you need a refresher on something and you don't want to jump into another whole training, you can just go there and see if it answers your questions. Um, reporting a problem will take you to the NKU help desk. Asking the community, so there's a forum community around Canvas so you can ask a question. You know, I've seen people where they'll ask the community about, well, you know, I teach this topic, what are some ideas about how to use Canvas to best do this topic and you'll get people like oh we did this project or we did this in canvas and it was great and like it's actually a really active community um nku student affairs link this is just so you don't have to link it directly in your course it's always there for students um, if they have if they need information about nku student affairs and submitting a feature idea is basically if you think there's something that canvas can do better or a feature, a, you know, a, a feature in Canvas that you're like, I don't really have, like for me, <laughs> the all courses page, why does that not sort? Like, why is that not a sortable page? 
I could create an idea and other people can vote on it. And then if it gets enough traction in the voting stage, they'll look into developing it. So Canvas really listens to its users. And so if you have, you know, or I like to go here sometimes and just look at what other ideas people have. And if I see one that I think is, I want, then I can vote on it. So it's kind of helpful. So that's the help menu. This little arrow down here at the very bottom is um, just a, a toggle for the menu. So you can make the menu smaller or larger. Um, so, you know, if you like it larger and all of a sudden it's smaller and you're like, what, how did that happen? It's just, you probably just click the arrow on accident. You can click it again to get it larger. All right, any questions before we jump back up to the account area? All right. The account area is your global settings. So these are strictly to you. They're not going to affect anything in a course. Um, do you guys need help back there? Are you doing good? No, we're okay. Thanks. Okay. I just don't want to, because I'm, I'm yeah. so far away. I need to, yeah, just, I like to check. Um, okay, if you need to log out of Canvas, like if you're on a lab computer or a teacher computer and you want to log out before you log out of the computer, you would click account and then click the log out button. And then these are the five um, settings areas. We're going to go into notifications first, which is in the middle. <clears throat> um, okay. The notifications page, you'll notice that I have two columns. You probably only have one and that's fine. So the second column that I have is for push notifications for devices. You will get this column if you ever add the Canvas app to a phone or tablet or other mobile device. So when you install that app, it asks you, do you want push notifications? And it's it's all or nothing, right? It's yes or no. So what happens is if you click yes, then you can come in here and actually manage which things you get push notifications about. The email address notifications are more, um, these are preset. The settings that are preset are pretty good. There's a few things I'll tell you that you might want to change, but for the most part, they're pretty accurate as far as what people want emails about. Um, I, but if you are like, oh my goodness, I'm getting too many emails from Canvas, you can come in here and make changes. Or if you're not getting enough, if you feel like you're missing something, you can come in here and make changes. But there are four options, that, and the legend is at the top, so you can kind of see what those categories are. The check mark means notify me right away, and that's an email. You'll get an email notification to your NKU email if the, those things occur. So for example, you'll notice the one, the green check marks are announcement. So when someone posts an announcement in a class, the student will get a notification right away. Now the one, one of the ones I might recommend that you change is this announcement created by you. By default, it's turned off, it's turned to the X, but most people like to get a copy of their announcements to make sure that it goes through and to make sure you know it's not floating out in the abyss of the internet. So you can change that to the check mark. So all you have to do is click the check mark, it turns green, and you're good to go. You don't have to hit save or anything like that. Um, so the check mark again means notify me right away, so you'll get an email instantaneously. The clock icon means a daily summary. So you'll get one email at the end of the day from Canvas that summarizes anything that's in the clock category, okay? And then the calendar icon is a weekly summary. So you'll get one email at the end of the week that summarizes everything in those categories. And then the X means do not send me anything. So for example, all submissions by default is turned off. Most people don't want to get emails every time students submit something, right? But if you wanted a daily summary, you could change that. Or if you do want to get an email every time a student submits something, that go for it. <laughs> But <laughs> it might be a little crazy. Um, but anyway, so this is how you would change your notifications. Um, like I said, the standard ones are pretty good. It's, it's pretty common um, preferences, but you know, you can always make changes depending on your needs and your preferences. Keep in mind, students can also change their own notification preferences. So if a student comes to you and says, I'm not getting any of your emails, I'm not getting any of your announcements. <laughs> You can bring them here. First of all, ask them, are you checking your NKU email address? You know, that's 
that's step one. And then step two is to, to point them here and make sure they didn't just, because I've seen it where students, the first day they get into Canvas, the first thing they do is they turn off all their notifications. Well, then they don't end up getting anything. So you can tell them, go into Canvas and turn on these notifications. And that's, um, I don't think, I think most students probably leave their notifications alone, but you know, you have, you, you all know that there's at least one or two that just go in and X, 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 X. I don't want any <laughs> notifications. Um, so those are notifications. Any questions about that? All right. The profile is the next one. This is a global profile. Again, like everything else, it's, this is your account, but your account is linked to your courses. So students will be able to see this really only if they're in one of your courses. Anytime they check, they click your name or your picture, they'll t it'll take them to this profile. Instead of having an instructor information page in each course, you're gonna, it's gonna have just one profile. Um, you can click edit profile and the contact area is preset. If a student's in your course, they're going to see a message bubble. They can message you from here. Part of my job is to play around with these settings. And I played around with some, <laughs> you can add your, like, you can sync your like LinkedIn profile with your Canvas profile. And I did that. And I, I really have no idea the benefit. Like I haven't seen anywhere where that's useful yet, but you, if you do that, you can add your LinkedIn profile to your con your profile in Canvas. I don't, you know, unless you're a business professor and that's like you're, you know, you're trying to teach students how to use LinkedIn, I don't, or unless you want, I don't know. It's up to you if you want to use that or not. You can also add Digo, Google Drive, Twitter, Skype, and Delicious, I think. Um, but those are all added in settings, which we'll, I'll show you in a minute. Not, nothing super important. I, I, like I said, I still have not really found a use for them. I synced them like thinking, this is great. And now what? There's nothing. Um, yeah. But the biography section, this is where I would recommend that you add like your office hours, office location, phone number. Um, if you want your email address linked in there separately from your Canvas messaging, this is probably where you, you would want to put it. Um, a short bio. You can also just link your faculty bio page on NKU's website if you want down here at the bottom under links. Um, you can add, if you have a blog, if you have, you know, if you want to link your department website, you can add as many links as you want. So um, down here you can do that. And then when you're done, you just click save profile. Most things in Canvas, you do have to click like save, but for some reason that notifications one, you don't have to, but most things you do have to hit save. So when you're done, you hit save. It makes any changes. This is also where you update your profile picture. So if you mouse over the picture icon, you get the little pencil, you click on that, and you can upload a photo or you can take a picture using your webcam. So there's also this thing called Gravatar. It's like a third party tool where you can have the same profile picture on multiple accounts. It's kind of one of those things where if you have one, you would know it. If you don't, <laughs> worry about it. Um, a cartoon character, I just, uh, I would do upload a picture, right? Of some right. cartoon character. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I do recommend, like, I, I recommend adding a picture or something that represents you. Um, I just think it's important. It's a visual uh, cue for students. And if you don't have it, there's still a picture there. It's just a picture of a blank, you know, profile photo. Um, and then I also, I usually have as part of my first week assignments for students to have them upload a photo. I don't usually re require them to upload a photo of themselves just for privacy reasons because some students don't like to do that, but I do require they do something and then I recommend that they do a photo of themselves because it does help like when you're grading that visual cue of like, oh, this is that student because you're, you know, we're very visual people and that does help us um, in our brains. So what does Canvas have the photo roster of students like Blackboard did? It does. It's in the course settings, and I'll show you how to get to that. Um, but you can't, it doesn't sync with the profile pictures. So they would still have to upload their own profile picture if they wanted to. Yeah. Yes. Do we uh, recreate the profile for each different course? 
No, this is a global profile outside of the course, so you can just update it as necessary. And then anytime the student sees your photo or name, they can click on it and see your profile. So you're not having to update it every time, which is kind of nice. So, so we don't uh, aim the biography for what I'm teaching a particular course. This is a generic thing. Right, generic. And you can, you can add a biography in each course if you want to. Okay. You know, so you, but this is like going to be a global, you know, overall profile. It's not going to be course specific. Good. Yeah. All right, we're going to skip files for now. We're going to come back to that and go to settings. So these are your global settings, and this is something you change. It's only for your account. Um, it's outside of the course. The top section, again, uh, this if you mouse over here, you can change your profile picture here as well. You have to, this doesn't really make sense to me, but like in order to edit these things, you have to click edit settings over on the far right. And the only things that you can change are language and time zone. <laughs> so um, the display name we have turned off for editing because it was all or nothing. So it would allow students and faculty <laughs> and staff to change their name or no one. And we just figured it probably wasn't a good idea to allow students to just change their name at whim. Now, if a student or a faculty member doesn't like the display name that's there and has a legitimate reason for having it changed, we can change that on the back end. So it's not set, 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 but it's just not editable by you. Um, so language and time zone you can change and then hit update. Over here on the right, you can change your contact information. So if you wanna add a secondary email address, you can do that. Um, you cannot remove your NKU email address because it's put there by our system, but if a student doesn't want their notifications going to NKU, they can add a secondary email address and then they can turn off their NKU notifications and turn on notifications for their personal email address. So they're able to control that, um, but they can't remove their NKU email address. Um, and then they, you can add a phone number if you want text notifications. I don't know who wants text messages notifications, but some people prefer that. <laughs> I'm just like, I get bombarded a million times a day enough. I don't need Canvas note text messages, but students might prefer that because it's so in their face. But for me, I'm like, no, I'm good. Um, downloading submissions, it's going to be most helpful for students. This is, um, if they click this, it's going to download a zip file of everything they've submitted to Canvas. So if their computer crashes and then the next semester they're like, oh, I want, I need that paper that I submitted last semester to like, you know, use as a reference or what you're, whatever they would use it for. Um, they can <laughs> click download submissions. Um, or if they're trying to put together a portfolio and they, you know, don't have a paper from previous years or whatever, they can do that. These web services are what I was talking about before, where you can link your account um, from various things to Canvas. Like I said, I haven't found much use for it other than maybe Google Drive, because then once it's synced, you can pull documents that you have stored from Canvas. Other than that, I'm not, I haven't found much use for these, but apparently Canvas can make your life a lot easier by tying itself with the web tools already in use. How it makes it easier, I'm not really sure, but <laughs> you can do that if you want to. Um, approved integrations. Like Robin was saying with Commons, the first time she logged in, it asked her to authorize it. Any third party tool is gonna ask for you to authorize it once the first time you use it. Once you authorize it, it's gonna show up in this list here. So this list will just continue to grow. It's not like an app on your phone where it's taking up space or anything like that. Like you don't really need to worry about it. It's not gonna hurt anything to have things here long term. Um, it's just a list of everything that you've authorized, basically. So you don't really need to worry about that. <clears throat> but if there was a reason you really wanted to get rid of something that you're not using anymore, you can come in here and remove it. And then down here at the bottom, there's feature options. So this is like for, um, especially for accessibility purposes, high contrast. If you don't like the black and gold or it hurts your eyes or you can't see the gold as well, you can turn on the blue and white version, and it's just supposed to be high contrast. Um, the other thing, underline links, you know, by default, our links are red. 
Uh, don't get me started on that. Link should be blue. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they are red currently and they are not underlined by default, which is fine. But let's say a student or a faculty member is red, green, colorblind and they can't see the red, they just see gray, they're gonna have a hard time differentiating regular text from a link. So if they turn this on, it underlines all the links so that they can see which things are links and which things are not links. So that's something they can turn on. Um, there's a course setup tutorial. This, I think, is turned on by default for instructors. So if you've noticed, if you're in a new course, you'll get this like menu that slides over from the right and tells you about what's going on in your course or what the page is for. And sometimes it's really helpful and other times it just gets in the way. So if you click end tutorial, you can come back in here and turn it back on if you want to or if you just want it off and it's, you can turn it off here. I have no idea what this means. This include byte order mark and gradebook. I don't think it is applicable to us. I think this is just an extra setting for, I think people in other countries that need certain like settings in their exports. I don't think we need it. So just ignore that. <laughs> it's new, it's brand new and it came and I was like, oh, there's a new feature. And I was like, yeah, I have no idea what it means. So I should probably look into that, but I don't think it's that important. Okay, so that's your settings. E-portfolios are the, basically you can create a portfolio or multiple portfolios. They're on your account. They're not linked to a course. So, and they're private. So you can create a portfolio. It uses a wizard tool so it can pull in submissions. So like if a student has been using Canvas for a couple semesters, they can create a portfolio and pull in things that they've submitted from their courses to develop their portfolio. So it's actually a really neat tool. Um, I think it's gonna be more useful in a couple of years when we've been using Canvas as, you know, for a couple of years. Um, but you know, as a faculty member, you could also create a portfolio and then share it with students or, <clears throat> you know, I think it's, it has some really neat uses, but it's not something that we have done a deep dive in yet just because it's not really that important right now. So if that's something that's interesting to you, you can click create a portfolio and kind of play around with it. If not, you don't need to. And last but not least in the uh, settings is files. And you'll, um, we'll get to this, but in each course, there is a files area that you can store documents, um, PowerPoints, PDFs, just like in, in Blackboard, there is a files area in Blackboard. A lot of people don't know that it's there, but there is one. And anytime you upload a document to Blackboard, it stores it in the file area called content. Same in Canvas. If you upload a document somewhere, it stores it in the files area. This is just where you can go to see all of your courses, files and documents in one place. So as you can see, I have a long list of courses here. I can click on a course, see all of my files in that course. I could drag one into another course to copy it. Um, I could use this to just kind of generally organize my files if they're getting a little unruly and I wanna come in here and just spend some time organizing things, I can do that. Um, but yeah, this is kind of, or if I have a document on my computer that I know I'm gonna put in you know, five courses, I can come here so that I can just quickly jump from one course to another, upload it, jump to the next one, upload it, instead of going into the course, then going to the files area, uploading it, then going to the next course, into the files area, and uploading it. You can add it in multiple places more quickly from here. <sighs> I talk a lot in this training, and I already gave this training once. <laughs> today so I'm like oh I need to sorry <laughs> it's a lot of talking any questions about this so far okay we're going to go next into the course but I'm gonna take like a five minute break if you need to run to the restroom or if you just have you know want to kind of process this I'm gonna run to the restroom really quick and I'll come back and then we'll jump into the course and course settings and how to organize your course in Canvas. So I will be right back. And if you need a quick break, you take, go ahead and take that now. Yeah. 
that soon. Yes. I sat through maybe an hour of the Canvas 101, all, just long enough for me to feel like, oh crap, I'm going to hate this. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't even try the online thing. I just back, I guess last fall, just sat down and well, that's oh, I'll just open it up and see what I can do with it. It's before and I knew we were going to have the option to do this. Yeah. So, yeah. I have to say, I'm grateful that they are offering. This. Carlo, did you start Canvas or did you nope. go? Nope, not started until I have to. The end, like me. All right. Hey, Jessica, will, will migrating courses from Blackboard to Canvas be part of any of the 10 hours of stuff this week? It is its own training. We used to try and combine it into this training, and it was just too much because it, I would have like 10 minutes at the end to talk about it, and it was just crazy. So. Um, That's the absolute most crucial thing I have to have done by the end of May. I know. I think we had talked about having more like workshop time for that. Um, and I don't know that Tani has scheduled it. So I will remind him that people are asking about it. 
Um, yeah, because it's time to fish or cut bait, right? I mean, we don't have any time anymore, and if blackboard's going away, we don't have our stuff out of it. Yeah, I mean, we had a bunch of migration trainings in April, but I know people were still busy. So let me let me message them right now while we're getting ready to get back in here. And I, I know there are videos and that sort of stuff. I, I realize that, but as far as I'm that is the absolute most crucial thing I need to know. Yes now and if and i've signed up for 10 hours of training this week but if that's not included in it that's a big disappointment right right let me let me message him really quick we'll see if he gets back to me okay thank you yeah um okay I'm going to get started again, and then um, if he messages me, I'll, I have, I, I have a feeling the answer is he hasn't scheduled them yet, but I will, I'm on him to get it scheduled. Good, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so jumping back into Canvas, this is, if, if there's anything that I would say besides migration that's kind of important, is this learning about the course and how it's different from Blackboard and the, the kind of key things you need to know to get it, your brain wrapped around it so you're not so frustrated when you try to migrate stuff or when you start to work in it. So I'm gonna try and go through things quickly, but if you have questions, this part, I always, this is the part where people are like, uh-huh, 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 and then like the gloss goes over because <laughs> it's a lot of information and it's super important, but it's very conceptual. And so that's where like the other trainings kind of fill in the gaps and get like down to the actual how to do stuff part. Um, so bear with me. I know this training is like, like, oh, uh huh, uh huh. Wait, what? <laughs> so um, if you do have questions, like I said, feel free to jump in and ask. Um, okay, so we're back to the course. Um, let me just jump in. I'm going to go ahead and go into my sandbox course, which is just essentially a development shell, kind of not connected to an actual live course that I can just kind of play in. Um, when you first log into, I'm going to go ahead and restart set it because I feel like that's going to be the most helpful so that you can see what it's going to be look like when you jump into a blank course. So when you first log into a course, the first thing you probably notice is the menu over here on the left and how it's different from Blackboard because we are very reliant on our menu in Blackboard for Blackboard users. Um, and it is very different. And so we're going to come back to that. But let me just kind of explain a little bit of what's going on. So we always have this global navigation on the left. Then we have the course menu. The course menu collapses by these three lines at the top. So if you ever don't see the menu, go ahead and click those three lines and it will reappear. The only place where it auto hides the menu is in the grade book. So and it's just to give you the most real estate in the grade book. Um, and so if you ever need to get back to the menu, especially from the grade book, you can click those three lines. Then we have the center area here, which is the home page. And you get to choose what appears here. So we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, but you have some choice in what is the home page. And then over here on the left, we have our course men home menu. So this is where you publish the course. It's right on the home page. You just click the big publish button and it makes it available to students. Um, and then you can import from Commons. If you have a class that, you know, if you have a resource in Commons that you want to bring into your class, you can click this button to get here. Oh, am I, am I hiding? Yes. Yeah, we can see the published thing. Yeah. Now you're good. Okay. Now you're good. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I forget sometimes. Um, choosing the home page, we're going to come back to this, but you get to choose what goes in the center area here. Viewing the course stream, this is going to be that recent activity stream that we had on the dashboard, but it's only for this course. It's just going to show any recent activity, recent announcements, recent discussions, recent assignments, that sort of thing. You can post a new announcement right from the homepage, and you can go into student view right from the homepage. Student view gives you like a test student user, and you can see, um, oh, I have an answer. We have 235, so the room you're in right now, reserved to do open sessions on the 29th through the 31st all day long. Ah, yes, thank you. That's, 
That's just in time teaching. <laughs> that's that's fabulous. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, and I think the reason we decided to just do all day sessions is because some people already know how to migrate and they just want to come and work and get help and other people need to come for the migration stuff. So, um, yeah, great. I recommend not coming on the 31st because then if you realize it's more work than you think it's going to be, you're going to have some trouble. <laughs> Um, okay, announcements. You can post announcement. You can go to Studio. The student view is going to show you exactly what students see, including how things are locked down. And it gives you a test student user where you can submit assignments, you can take quizzes, you can do all of that from the student user and then um, uh, do, do all of that. Just kind of like in Blackboard when you go into student view. Um, then you also have a coming up menu and a to do list on your course homepage. Okay, now he won't stop messaging me. Great, cool, thanks. Okay, um, the to-do list and coming up menu will generate if there's anything to show. But right now there's, it says coming up, nothing for the next week, so there, it's because I don't have anything. And because I don't have anything to do, it's not showing up as a menu at all. So that's kind of the home page. But now let's talk about the menu. Um, this is where we kind of have to take a step back and talk about main differences between Canvas and Blackboard. And if you'll imagine your Blackboard course with me for a minute, you probably think about the menu and the content folders you have on the menu. And when you first log into a new Blackboard course, there's not much on the menu, but you can add things yourself. You can, you know, and you're really essentially building the course organization and the course structure as you build the content, right? So as you, you add a folder, you add content, but you also add other folders and that creates the organization of the course as you build your content. So essentially the difference here is that instead of having your course organization and structure built on the menu like we do in Blackboard, the menu is for tools. So it stores the tools and the areas where you build your content, but your organization is built through modules and pages. And we're gonna talk about what that means in a little bit. But essentially the tools on the menu are how you build content, but it's not, like you can't, I get this asked this a lot for quizzes, for example. Can I change the name of quizzes to exams? No, because it's not a content folder. It's not an, a folder where you store your exams. It's a tool to create what Canvas calls quizzes. So it does store all of your quizzes, you can call those exams, you can call them knowledge checks, you can call them pop quizzes, you can call them surveys, but the tool to create them and store them is called quizzes. Does that help kind of make sense? Maybe, like this is where the, okay, uh-huh, uh-huh, oh, wait, what, and we'll just keep going, we'll, we're forging through. Um, the pages area, for example, content pages are used to add text, add images, videos, you can add documents through pages. You can, it's basically essentially at used kind of multi-purpose. You can use it to add content and context, or you can add it to kind of add to your organization. Now, this pages area is just gonna be one long list of all of the pages in your course, but that's not probably how you wanna organize it. You mostly want, you probably wanna organize it by unit or uh, week, right? And then you can't really do that from the pages area. So you would do that from the modules area. So the tools over here on the left are for you. And you get to decide which tools the students have access to. So for example, the pages area is helpful if you're creating a lot of pages, you wanna be able to come here and manage them. That doesn't mean that the students need access to the pages area because if you're using modules and you have a weekly folder or a weekly module where you're putting everything they need for the week, they don't also need access to this pages area because you've put the pages that they need into the weekly module. So you can lock this down. You don't have to have it available to students. And so that's where we're gonna kind of talk about, well, what things should be available to students, what things shouldn't, and it's gonna depend on your preferences and your content but let me show you, I think the best way to kind of demonstrate this is just to show you a few courses. Um, 
and some examples of how people are using Canvas. Okay, so this first course here is a biology class. Um, it's fully online, so it's very content heavy. There is a ton of content in this course. Very um, text heavy, PowerPoint heavy, uh, and video heavy. She has, as you can see over on the left, you'll notice the menu looks a little different than it did in my sandbox course. The top five or six items are black and the rest of them are grayed out. Now, the grayed out area, there's two reasons why things might be grayed out. The first reason is there's nothing to show. So for example, if I had announcements available to students, but I don't have any announcements yet, it's gonna gray it out so that, because there's nothing for them to see, so they gray it out. Grayed out means it's not available to students. The other, the second reason why something might not, might be grayed out is because you have chosen to hide that from students. So for example, pages, she has tons of pages in her course. So there's no, this is not grayed out because there's nothing to show. It's grayed out because she's chosen to not show it to students. Discussions, she's chosen not to have the discussions area available to students. And if she uses discussions, they're going to be individually added to the module where it's appropriate, as opposed to just leaving the discussions area open. Um, so, so that's why some of these are grayed out. If I go into the student view over here on the right, you'll see exactly how the students see it. Much cleaner, much less confusing, much, much less daunting, right? So the student view is going to give you kind of an indication of how students view the flow of your course, and you have full control of that. You can leave things open. If you have a very discussion heavy class and you want them to be able to jump right to a discussion from the discussions area, you can leave that discussions area open. But if you, you only have them using it twice and you really only want them to get to it through the weekly content, you can do that too. You don't have to leave that open. So it's really up to you. So in her class, she has this landing page here. She has a nice banner. It's very visually appealing, welcoming. You know, she's welcome to the human anatomy and physiology two lecture. It kind of explains how the course is organized. She says to access the course resources, go to the modules page. So she's giving them directions to go to the modules page. And then she has a few kind of buttons down here that she's created using images and then linking those images to various areas of the course, which Canvas makes very easy to do. But essentially, she's sending them from this landing page to the modules, which is where all of her content is. So then the modules, this is where we can kind of talk about well, what is modules. So modules, it's not a new tool. It's a tool that was available in Blackboard. It's a tool that, you know, we use the term modules, but this is just something that Canvas has chosen to highlight as its main organizational tool. And essentially each module contains whatever you want it to. Um, and so these are each modules, but as a whole, the modules page creates like I would call it an outline for your course, or um, I think even a better illustration is a table of contents for an ebook that you're kind of creating of your course. So it's meant to be kind of sequential. You can see that this is very um, utilitarian. It's very um, kind of bland and stark, and it's really meant to be an outline. And you know, I had a I had a professor recently ask me, well. It's not pretty enough, <laughs> and I understand the use of organizing it this way because what it does is it creates a course flow, and so once you're in it, you can go next, like you can go next, 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 and work your way through it, which is really useful, um, but she didn't want students to see this outline view, and so my ex, you know, my trying to talk to her about it because I felt that way when I first started using modules too, and then over time, I started realizing how useful they were to students and how helpful they were because a student can essentially come in and say, well, I've already worked through all of these and I just want to jump right to this one. And so I kind of explained to her, well, that would be like taking out the table of contents, you know, from your dissertation or for a book because, because it's not content related or because it's not pretty. And it's not pretty, it's not really visually appealing, but it's helpful. 
helpful, right? It's useful. And so students can use this to jump to where they need to go. Um, it also helps you organize your course, organize your content. Now, like I said, her course is very, very content heavy. She has a ton of information in this course. Most courses are not going to have this many pages in a module. Um, let me show you another course here. Oops, I got to remember to leave student view or else it gets mad at me. Okay. So if I go into this course, she has a very similar kind of um, menu where she has most of it gone. In fact, she's chosen to just have the home page be the modules. So that outline is, is the modules, um, is the home page. And <clears throat> whoops, it's loading still. Okay. So, but, and it's not as welcoming as or pretty as the or other class was, but when you click the first page, welcome, she has a nice banner here. So you can still add those visual elements. You're just adding them to each page or each assignment as opposed to adding it to that home page. Um, and then once something is in the module, in the organizational flow, it creates this navigation inherently. So the next button is gonna take me to whatever is next on the module list. So now I've got the course syllabus and information, you know, I can, and you can link to documents right within a page. You can link to other out external websites. Um, let's see what else you can add. I know she has a video in here somewhere. You can add videos, you can add um, a lot of different things. Let me go back home. But let's say I'm a student, I've already worked through the getting started module. Um, come on. I need to be like, Tommy, stop messaging me. I'm still in my training. <laughs> I can, as a student, I can minimize this. And now I'm only seeing like week one. So it's not like you have to have this long list of things because you can, each module can be minimized to then so you can see whatever's next. Uh, and she has, you know, week one, okay, week one expectations is a page. You can see the icons represent what they are. So the page icon, you see the rocket ship is a quiz icon. Um, down here, she's got a, the paper with pencil, which means it's an assignment. So this is something they actually need to submit, the reflection. Um, let's see what else. Well, I'm just going to, hold on, give me a second. <clears throat> okay. Um, so this is going to be more what a normal course looks like as far as content in each module. Um, and, and you can add whatever you want to the module. So you can add pages for information or to put, you know, she's got a lot of just information about the weekly schedule, what they need to be working on. And then, you know, in the next page, she's ha she has, well, of course, this is like the one page that she doesn't actually have a video on. Hold on. I don't know why everything's taking so long to load. Okay, so this page has, you know, she's got text and links and videos, you know, open uh, for Tegrity and she's got some other videos too. So you really can use this, use pages to really organize things, you know, however you want. Um, let's see. Hey, Jessica, I have a quick question. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is training, but What's the recommendation, Tegrity or Kaltura, for recording lectures? Um, I'm currently recommending Kaltura. The reason is, is they're actually looking at eliminating Tegrity. <laughs> okay. um, because, but it's that I don't, I don't say that to panic people because I know in the past a lot of people have used Tegrity, um, and those videos will be moved over to Kaltura. So, but at this point. If you're going to be doing new videos, I recommend Kaltura. We now have access to Kaltura's um, lecture. It's like called Capture Space Lite. You can record your webcam and the screen at the same time. We're getting access to their um, classroom recorder eventually. And so it's, it basically does everything Kaltura did and what Tegrity does all in one, which is why we're looking to move fully to Kaltura. Um, both now have um, auto-generated captions. So it's not really a matter of accessibility because they both, so 
I re I'm recommending Kaltura. I think it's easier to use too, personally. Um, you can actually embed <clears throat> um, on a Canvas page, there's a Kaltura button and literally you click that button, you see all of your Kaltura videos, you click one and it embeds it right in the page. So it's, it's very easy to use with Canvas. It's looking like we're going in that direction. So I, and there's no issue with it accessibility wise. So I would recommend Kaltura. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think I've kind of explained as much as I need to for this for now, but you'll you see that she doesn't even have modules on the list. She just has the modules at the home page. Um, and she just basically has a pretty bare bones minimum as far as the menu goes for what students need. I'm gonna leave student view. I'm gonna show you one other class really briefly. This, both of the Spanish class and the biology class that I showed you were fully online. This class here is actually an in-person class um, but he's still using the modules to organize everything. And he has just a weekly module where he's putting the week one tasks and then any assignments or quizzes or links that they need for the week into the module. So again, and but he has not chosen to limit what students have access to on the menu. And I would guess, um, I actually know this for a fact, this created some confusion from students um, because he just left everything open. And so this is where the menu kind of becomes, well, I can get to this assignment here, or I can go to assignments, or I can get to it from, you know, and so you really want to think through, okay, how do I want students accessing my content? Do I want it? Because you still, and I think that's where people, if you really get down to the root of it, where people kind of have struggled with the, fold, the removal of folders, <laughs> because that's how we controlled how students got to things in our Blackboard course right essentially you can still do that in canvas it's just different you can still have full control of how students get to the content that you want them to have access to but the way to do that is through managing what appears on the menu and then organizing it into modules and using pages um, to organize your content um, in the way that it works for your class and for your content and for your preferences as an instructor so that's kind of just an example. I, I usually have found that that kind of helps to just see <laughs> an example. Um, I hope that was helpful to see some examples of courses. Let's jump over. I'm going to jump back to my PowerPoint. So then the question becomes, well, what the heck is on the menu? There's so much there. How do we even get started understanding what's there? And so what I, I did is I took everything that was on the menu and I kind of broke it down into different categories. And so we're going to go over these categories. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about um, those and yeah. So basically the four categories that I've found that I think are kind of help organize the course menu is there's kind of some main course tools, some tools that you're gonna use pretty much no matter what, even if you're using Canvas only a little bit, you're gonna use these. Then there's the content creation tools, the tools that you're going to use to actually build content within Canvas, right? Um, and then there's communication tools, and then there's some additional things, um, which we'll talk about. And then once we're done talking about what these are, I will actually show you how you can edit the navigation and other course settings. So that will be kind of at the end, and then that will be it. <laughs> so what are all in all of these? So the main course tools, the things that you'll probably use no matter what are home, grades, syllabus, and settings. So we're actually going to do a deep dive into each of these, except for grades, we'll do a, a minute, a little dive. We'll go into the waiting pool in that one. Um, <laughs> because that's covered in another training, but I think there are some things you do need to know right off the bat about grades. But we'll talk about home, syllabus, and settings pretty in depth. Um, the content creation tools, all of these are covered in other trainings, so I'm just going to basically tell you what they are, and we've already talked about as much as we'll talk about with these. So assignments, this is going to be anything that's graded, um, anything that students submit to Canvas, as well as anything that they've turned in, like, in class, but you need to grade and put a grade in Canvas. So everything that you need graded, essentially, is the assignments. Discussions are discussions. They're the same as in Blackboard. It's just a discussion forum. You can create threads um, for discussion. Pages, again, this is a very multi 
repurpose tool. You can use it for content and organization. Um, if you really need folders, like you really need to organize your content, which is a, I use pages like folders. Like let's say you have 10 documents for that you need to give them for a project and you don't want to put all 10 documents individually in a module because it takes up a ton of space and the modules are meant to go sequentially and you might not think those documents really need to go sequentially. They just need to be able to access them, right? You can link all 10 of those documents on one page and it's essentially kind of like a folder because you're putting everything in one place and, and putting those, um, you would put that page in a module, like you could put it in a weekly module or even in like a course resources module, but you, it allows you to kind of tuck things out of the way, just like you used to with folders. So pages can be used both as a way to communicate information, but also a way to help organize and keep things clean and organized. Files is just going to be any documents, PowerPoints, Excel files, PDFs, anything from your computer that you're giving students access to is essentially stored in the files area. Um, <clears throat> quizzes, these are those, the tool, the, the quizzing tool. So you're able to create multiple choice quizzes, essay question quizzes, all of that. Um, these are just the auto gener or the auto graded ones. Um, just like you would build a, what are they called in, in Blackboard exams, right? It's, it's the same tool, essentially. And then modules, we've already kind of talked about it, creates an outline or um, kind of table of contents for your course and allows you to really organize all of these other items. You can add everything, uh, and all of these other items can be added to the module. So you're able to really build your content and then organize it through the modules the way that you want to. <clears throat> the main communication tools, um, announcements, just like announcements in Blackboard. Um, people, this is where you're gonna see a list of your class. This is also where you at, use group work. So if you're creating groups for um, you know, any group work, you would build those groups in the people page and then um, manage those groups from the people page. Conferences is a virtual conferencing tool in Canvas. It's kind of like this Zoom interface, but it's built right into your Canvas course. So if you teach a fully online course and you need to do, you know, virtual office hours or you need to meet with a student one-on-one, -on -one, or even if you want to have a live session for your whole class, you can use that tool. The only caveat to that is that it's a free version of the tool, so it you can record it, but the sessions can't be downloaded. And then you also can't, um, like, the, I think the sessions only last two weeks, so you can, they're not meant to be like long-term lectures like you would use Tegrity or Kaltura for. They're just meant to, like, if I was going to record this session here and then post it for two weeks so people could review it, and then it would go away. And then the chat feature is my least favorite feature of all of Canvas. If I had to pick one, <laughs> this is what I would choose. I just try to be honest with you guys. <laughs> um, but basically the chat feature is just a perpetual chat. So it's like someone posts a message and the next person posts a message. You can't respond to individual people. You can't break out and talk to individual people privately. It's not threaded. To me, it's kind of useless unless it's for like one icebreaker at the beginning of the semester or maybe one brainstorming session for the whole class. Um, but to me, I'm like, just use a discussion board for that. Cause then at least people can respond to each other in the discussion board. So I, I don't know. And then you can close the discussion board for comments. Like when it's done, I don't know. It just, the chat bugs me. <laughs> like as a teacher, like deep down, that's what I am. I'm a teacher at heart. I just think of it and it just, I just cringe because to me, that's something else I have to manage and something else I have to remember to check and something else I have to make sure students are using appropriately. And I just... I just don't like it. That's just my own. But maybe you have a great idea for using the chat and then please tell me so that I can use it as an example so I don't seem bitter about the chat in my trainings. <laughs> um, I hope the black or I hope the canvas eventually develops it to be a better tool, but for right now it's just not. 
Um, additional tools, this is where you're going to find kind of all of your external tools like Tegrity, Kaltura, Lockdown Browser. There's an attendance tool that's awesome. If you do in-person classes and you like to take attendance, I highly recommend you use it. Um, NetTutor, Office 365. Uh, outcomes is where you would build rubrics for the course. You can also build rubrics right from each assignment, but um, if you want to manage them, you would do it through outcomes. <sighs> What else is there? This is also where you would find the additional tools areas where you're going to find like the student photo roster. It's where you're going to find if you use any external tools like um, Pearson or MindTap or any of that. Those are all additional tools that can be added to the menu, but they're currently hidden and I'll show you how to get to those. So, <clears throat> All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through home, grade, syllabus, and settings. Settings will be the last thing we go over, which will include how to manage your navigation and organize it on the menu. So um, we've already talked about home. The last thing we really need to talk about with that is um, choosing your home page. I have way too many classes right now. I really need to go through them. Okay, so we've already talked about the home page. You've got the menu, you've got your center area, which you can choose as we saw in those example courses. And then over here we have our home page menu. Choosing the home page, you click this choose home page button on the far right. Of course, I'm probably hiding it. Choose home page button on the far right. And once you click that, you get this dialog box that appears. And these are the options you can choose from the, for the home page. The course activity stream, which is like that we've, I've shown you what it is. It's those kind of notifications about what's recent activity in the course. Um, if you don't have this as your homepage, students and yourself can always get to it by clicking view course stream. So <clears throat> if you don't really like it, I don't know that it's necessary to have it as your homepage because they can still access it. Um, the pages front page is how you would make a customi customized homepage page your home page so bear with me this is really confusing and I still don't really fully understand why it is the way that it is but basically the pages area in canvas has the ability to have what's called a front page I don't really understand what it's useful for but it, it, it does have the ability to have that it's almost like a home page but for just the pages area you have to have a page set as the pages area front page in order to make it the home page of your course. But to me, then that's redundant. I don't know. It is what it is. But if you have a front page set for the pages area, you can make it your home page. So that was that what the biology one? Yes. Did? Yeah. So you just have to create a page in your course and then set it as the front page. <laughs> for the pages area and then you can choose it as the home page. It's very complicated. It's not as complicated. Once you do it once, you're like, oh, I get it now. But like when I'm explaining it, it yeah, it's not easy to explain. You can also set the course modules as the home page. We typically recommend either a front page or like a home page, customized page or a modules as the home page. Penn State did a study about student preferences and student success with what the homepage should be. And far and away, most students preferred having the modules as the homepage. And I think the reason for that is just that it's, it's one less thing they have to click, click to get to their content. So if, you know, if you have a homepage, that's great, it's pretty, but after the first week, it's, no, it's noise to them. They've already read the information there. So it's just kind of in the way of them getting to where they need to go for the week. So unless you have like a weekly button for them to click on which week it is and that takes them right to the yeah. weekly module, which is, a, is an idea. We've, we've helped people set that up before. Having the modules page, it's just what they need is right there. They just scroll down to the week they're on and everything they need is right there. Um, you can have the assignment list as your homepage. I usually only recommend that if you're an in-person class and you really don't use it for much other than grading and having them submit certain things. Um, if you use it at all for giving them documents or information, I don't recommend this because this is only gonna show them 
the to-do items, the, the action items, the things that are graded. <clears throat> and then the syllabus page, we're going to talk about what that is in a minute, but you can also have that set as your home page. So there's, that's how you choose your home page. And I think we've covered everything in the home page area. So the next thing we're going to talk about is grades. Um, the grade book in Canvas is your typical grade book as far as, you know, columns and student rows and all that. Um, a couple things about it that I think are important for you to know is that the biggest difference that I know people struggle with is that you can't just create a column in your grade book. You have to actually create an assignment. Just like everything else in Canvas, at, the grade book is generated from what's already in the course. So if you don't have something in the course, it's not going to show in the grade book. Um, so at first that seems like a huge hassle, but it's just a different workflow. It's just a little bit different. So instead of coming to the grade book and adding a column here, you want to go to the assignments area. So you would just click on the menu assignments. And then again, like I said before, your assignments page is going to be kind of how you manage your gradebook, and it's just going to show everything that's graded. So you can have different categories of assignments or groups. They're called groups on the assignment page. So I could create a group called exams. I could create and I could create a group called, you know, participation and so on and so on. So I have different groups of assignments. What that does is that creates subtotal columns in the gradebook. So this allows you as a teacher to say, if a student comes to you and says, what, you know, why am I getting a C? You can look at the grade book and you can actually look at their subtotal columns and say, well, you're doing really good on getting your daily assignments done, but you're bombing the exams. You're not studying. So you can actually kind of see that the subcategories in the grade book that help you kind of see those categories. If you don't use that, you can just put everything into the assignments category. That's fine too. But once you add an assignment, so let's add, um, so there's two ways. You can add the plus assignment button. This is going to give you full editing to the assignment. It's going to allow you to add a description, upload documents, set a due date. It's going to give you an option to choose how they submit the assignment, whether that's they submit it online or on paper and all of that. But if you just want a column in your gradebook, you can click this plus button in whatever category you're going into. And then it just gives you like a quick, quick way to add an assignment. So if I'm adding like, like, let's say, you know, they have participation points and I want to just quickly add a participation column in the grade book. I can click the plus button in the participation group. And this is all I get. I can click more options if I want full editing rights or full, you know, all of the editing, but I can give it a name. I can give it a due date. Again, this is going to make it show up on the to-do list. So if it's not something that you need to show up on the to-do list, you don't necessarily have to give it a due date. Um, and then the points, I'm going to give, well, okay, let's say 10 points for the day. I hit save and publish. This publishes the assignment. If I want to, I can still go in and make other changes to it, but it just gives me kind of a bare bones assignment. Come on. There we go. Now it's on this page, and if I go back to my grades, I have that column in the gradebook. I also see those subtotal categories, those groups that I created. If I add participation points, I see now the score in the column. I also see what percentage that is of this group and how that affects the total grade. So this is where, you know, they could see, you could say, well, you're, you know, you're not showing up for class. So you, you're getting zero participation, but you're doing good on the exams or whatever, you know. So that's kind of the grade book. There's a lot more to the grade book. If you come to the grading training, Nick does a fantastic job at walking you through all, everything. But I like to just kind of explain that because I know some people that's all they do. Is like, I just need to add a column in the grade book. And so I like to kind of show you that. Um, the syllabus page. This page is also a really great tool. There's two parts to it. Well, there's more than two parts. The two main parts. This top section here, the course syllabus section, is fully editable. You click edit and you can 
add text. You can add, you can upload a document. Like you were asking before, Bob, I think you were asking me, can I just, how do I just upload my syllabus, right? right. So you would come to the syllabus page and you have the full editing. So you could say, you know, click here to download the syllabus. Um, and I can add a document right from here. Canvas works a little differently. You don't really attach documents like you did in Blackboard. You just upload them and then link to those documents. So you can do that two ways. You can go to the files area directly and upload the file and then link to it. Or you can just upload things as you go. So for example, let's say I have, you know, I want to upload my syllabus. Over here on the right, anytime you have a place to edit text, you're going to see this and it's called the content selector. And the content selector allows you to link to anything you already have in your course. You can link to other pages, you can link to other assignments, you can link to announcements, modules, pretty much anything. But you can also link to files, which is the second tab over. So any file you have uploaded to your course, you have access to link to that. Now, if I had a bunch of files uploaded, you would see a list of files here on the right. I don't have any because this is a brand new course, but I have this option to upload a new file. So I can click this, choose file, and I get this, you know, I can go to my computer and search for my syllabus. Um, and, you know, I can click on it. I don't, I don't even know. Um, so I've, I have it selected. If I have multiple folders in my files area, I can choose which folder it goes into. And then I click upload. And not only does it add it to the course files area, but it puts a link to it right in my text area. So let's say I had already had that uploaded and I see it here. All I have to do is click on it and it adds a link. If I have text highlighted, I can click on it and it creates a link on top of the text that's there. So you can either link using text or just put a link directly with the name of the document. Um, it's going to work the same. Then I click update and what it does is it links to that file. It usually takes a second to upload, but it gives you, if you click on the link, it downloads it. And then you also get this icon here on the right. When I click on that icon, it loads an inline preview of whatever the document is. So if it was a PowerPoint, I could just, as a student, quickly browse through the PowerPoint. I can browse through, okay, all I wanna know is the grading, right? I can go ahead and click the grading and you know look at the grading thing and all of that. But um, that's how you would upload a, docu a syllabus. So you can also upload other files like that on other pages. This is just the syllabus page. That's why I use the syllabus as an example. So that's the course syllabus area of this page. And then you have the course summary area. The course summary is auto generated by Canvas. You can't edit this. So if you add you notice how I have the participation assignment we added earlier. It's just there because I added it. I didn't add a due date. So it's not going to be in due date order. It's just going to be in alphabetical order. But if I had added due dates to all of my assignments, they would create kind of a course schedule for me. It's almost like the calendar, but in a um, schedule format instead of a calendar format. So it gives you just, it kind of creates it yourself. If you change a due date, it updates it. Um, so again, it's auto-generated. So whatever you have in your course is going to reflect here. If you added an event on the calendar, like a guest speaker, it would also add it to this too. <laughs> So it really reflects kind of everything that has a date attached to it. Um, and then it also shows students the waiting. If you have weighted grades, it shows them the breakdown of that right on this page. Um, yeah, so that's the course syllabus. Any questions about this page? Some people don't like this page and that's fine. You don't have to use it. You can hide it just like you can hide everything else and then you could just put the syllabus document somewhere else, that's fine too. But it is, I like it once you get used to it. It's a really neat tool, I think, because it's it does a lot of the work for you. <clears throat> Talk about the relations between the relation between using syllabus and module to structure what a student sees. Yeah, so the syllabus, like this course summary, is going to be in due date order. So it's going to only show those action items, almost like um, the calendar would. It's only going to show them like the, the 
those to do items, like the things that I'm going to have graded or the things that are due date bound. The module, you can put anything. So you can put a, you know, a, a PDF that you want them to review, but it's not graded or it doesn't have a due date attached to it. It's not going to show up on this summary page, but it will show up in the module wherever you want it to. It also, um, with the modules, you can lock things down. So you could lock a whole module down to open on a certain date. And even if there's an assignment in that module, if they click on that assignment from here, it will just tell them, sorry, this is locked until this date. So the modules really gives you control. It's where you get to organize your flow, your sequence, your locking, your, you know, releasing things at different times and all of that. So that's kind of the difference. This is just going to give them a schedule. It does give them a link to get into those assignments, but if you've chosen to lock things down, like through a module, the module settings are king. Their Canvas recognizes the module settings above anything else. So, yeah. Um, okay, last but not least, we're going to talk about the settings. <clears throat> I always say when in doubt, it's probably in the course settings. <laughs> Pretty much everything you need as far as settings or weird features are going to be in the course settings. <coughs> um, okay, so there's five tabs across the top we're going to talk about. Mo we're going to really focus on course details and navigation, but I'll talk about the other ones really briefly. And then over on the right, we have kind of the main <coughs> menu that just has some basic settings. So sharing your course to Commons, if you wanted to share your entire course, this is where you would go to do that. You have the student view option from here as well. Course statistics is just going to give you some basic statistics on the breakdown of like your assignments and stuff. Um, course calendar is just going to take you to the calendar page, but only show you this course. Concluding this course, um, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it will it will lock you out of the course as well, which you don't want that, you know, you can restrict students from it, which I'll show you how to do in a minute. But if you conclude it, it like, it's like this course is done, and then you can't even copy it. And it's really frustrating. And then we have to go in and unconclude it for you. You don't, I don't even think you have the option to delete. But if you do, don't do that either. Um, importing course content is where you would go both to bring content in from Blackboard, but also if you're going to copy a course, um, it's the opposite of Blackboard. So for in Blackboard, you go to the old course and you push information to the new course, right? In Canvas, you go to the new course and you pull information from any old courses. Um, so that's why you would use import course content. Exporting course content is just going to give you a zip file of your course. So this could be helpful if you want to just save a copy of it on your hard drive or if you want to share it with someone at another university or whatever, you can export a zip file version of it. Resetting the course, this is just going to wipe everything out and give you a fresh start. I do not recommend doing that when you have live students. <laughs> that would be bad. But you know, if you have a sandbox or a development shell and you just want a fresh start, you can click this and it will reset everything for you. And then validating links in the content. This is going to check all of your external links and make sure that they still work. So if you have any error, 404 errors, like, hey, this page doesn't exist anymore, Canvas will actually tell you when you run this validation. And then you can go and fix them, which is really helpful. So if you have a lot of external links, I highly recommend you do this at least once a semester, if not more often than that. Um, OK. Course details. This is kind of like your main course settings here. This is where you add the image. If you want to add an image to the card, you just click the choose image button and you can upload an image from your computer or you can search Flickr for something that relates to your course content. The name of the course, this is where you can add that section number like I was talking about. If you add, you know, if you want to add a section number or some sort of differentiation so that you can tell the difference between the two classes. For example, if you merge two classes, like Bob, I think you were, it's Bob, right? Right. Yeah, you were talking about having like in Blackboard, you have the two normal shells that you don't really use and then you have the merge shell. Um, in Canvas, you probably would want to put something like M or merge or something so that you can tell the difference in Canvas. Uh, there's something else comes up. Um, 
one frustration at NK right now is that we can't list the theme of the course. And so like, um, I teach Moby Dick in the arts and it's not called that either in the English or the honors. It has, they have totally different names in the course catalogs for those departments. So they're like three operative names. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and the students, when they enroll in the course, they cannot see it's Moby Dick in the Arts. They see it's Studies in American Literature or Honors in Humanity or something. So, you know, that's kind of a registration problem that I think we haven't solved yet. But um, what, what would you recommend, you know, for putting a, the, the, the theme that would be both courses could use that, or does that mess up everything else in how this relates to the registrar? So, do, do we have to use the official name for the course? No, you can use whatever that. name you want. You can you can change the name. Um, just make sure it makes sense to students because they do see the name of the course, the students do. Right. But it doesn't affect the registration. The course code is what links it to the registration. So as long as the course so code is accurate, you can... The number of the section and then give our name to the course? The, yeah. The, the name to the course? Which or you can even just change the name if you know that that's... You know, if you teach one section of it at every semester, you can just right. add the name. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. No problem. Um, yeah, time zone. The name up at the top. Yes. Okay. Right. You may not even be able to change the course code, to be honest. Mine isn't like linked to SAP, so I, I can, but I don't think you can change that. And this course code that I have on for the fall does show the section number. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But but that won't show, that's one field, and most of the menus only show this field, the name field. Right. So you want to make sure that whatever's in the name is what you can differ, you can use to identify your course. Yes. Yeah. You can change the time zone. Um, okay, the start and end date. This is what's really important. If you want, like let's say you want to uh, uh, publish your course so that it's available the week ahead and you can communicate with students but you are not ready yet and you, <laughs> you need that extra week to make sure your course is ready, you can set a start date. And then down here, there's, there's a couple options. You can set it so that users can participate between those dates. So they'll be able to see the course, but they won't be able to like uh, submit it any assignments, take any quizzes, post any discussion boards. But if you don't even want them to see it, you just want, you don't, want them to see anything, there's another option down here that restricts students from viewing the course before the start date. So you could set a start date and then restrict students. They won't even see it on their dashboard until the start date appears, but you can publish the course and communicate with them. They just won't see the course until that start date. And if you decide you're ready before the start date, you can just come in here and uncheck that box. Um, so that's how if you need to publish the course to communicate, but you don't want them to see anything, that's how you would do that. And don't worry, I don't expect you to remember that if you want, if, you have, if you're like, oh, I know Jessica told me how to do that, but I don't remember, you just shoot me an email and I'll send you the instructions. Um, you can set the language of the course, the grading scheme. This is important. Um, this is another thing I know you're, it's kind of one of those things you're probably not going to remember, so I'm not going to go into detail, but basically you have to set the NKU grading scheme and then you can, that's how you can export it to SAP. So if you want to export grades to SAP, you have to have the grading scheme set first. Um, so you'll want to do that. And we usually send out those instructions towards the end of the semester anyways, but. Um, down here at the bottom, there's this more options link that you would think is not very important, but there's actually quite a few important things here, like hiding the grade totals. If you want to hide their grade for a while while you're working on something, you can hide the total grade from them. Um, letting students create their own discussion topics. You have to like, some of these settings are pretty important. So just make sure you go through them and figure out what, which things you want. Some people don't like that you can't set the announcements page as the home page in Canvas, but you can actually show recent announcements on the home page if you want to. So if you really want that front and center when they log in, um, you can set that up. So there's quite a few options here that are kind of important. And then you need to remember to click update course details when you make any changes or it's not gonna stick. And I've done that before where I get it all exactly the way I want it and then I forget to hit update and I'm like, oh. <laughs> Very frustrating. 
Um, sections, if you merge two courses, but then you want to re-split them out by section so that you can still differentiate, you can do that. Um, Canvas allows you to do that, which is kind of nice. Navigation, yeah. Well, um, is it similar to Blackboard that if we do merge and then we're importing into my NKU that it will pull them by section or should we? It's exactly like it was in Blackboard. So if you're merged, if, if, if the merge tool is actually not related to Blackboard, it has to do with our system. So it actually creates a merge in our system of those two courses. So yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, the navigation, this is what, uh, the last thing we'll really hit on, but this is how you manage what's on the menu. Um, someone asked about the student photo roster. I don't have it on my list because this isn't a real course, but if you were gonna, if you did have a real course, you would see this, see it on there. <clears throat> there's two sections here, this top section, and then there's a bottom section. The top section is what is visible to students. So right now, currently, it has basically a mirror of my menu because this is what's set as visible to students. The bottom section is what's not visible to students. So if you like the student, and then some tools like the student photo roster, you have to enable from down here, but it still doesn't give students access because that's not a student accessible tool. So certain things like that, you don't have to worry about students seeing that, it's just for you. Um, but let's say you don't want them to have access to the chat <laughs> since this is my least favorite tool. Um, there's two ways you can do this. You can drag it down to this bottom section or you can click the three dots and click disable. That will take it to the bottom of this bottom section. So you can also drag the top items around to put them in a different order. So if you have a very, I'm very particular about how I like my menu and courses that I teach. So I like to make sure that they are the way that I want them. I usually do like home announcements, syllabus, you know, modules, grades, and that's about it. And then I hide everything else, but I like them in a specific order. So then I can arrange those in the order that I want and then hide everything else. Um, and then I can, you know, bring everything else, bring something up. Like, let's say I want to use Kaltura. I can bring that up so that I have access to use it or Tegrity or whatever else. And then once I'm done making it the way that I want this top section here, then I click save down at the bottom and it will update the menu in my actual course. So this is how you have the control of, you know, how students see things how they get to things. Um, and that's where you really just have to make some decisions. And if you want, you know, my input, I'd be happy to meet with you or one of the other instructional designers. Um, I am of the philosophy that less is more on the menu. I feel like too much can confuse students. And so, you know, you figuring out how you want to organize things and then hiding everything else is to me the best option, but it's really ultimately up to you. And then apps. These are just third party tools that you can add. Most of the ones that we use are already added, but you can search through them. Some of them are free, some of them require licenses, but there's some neat ones if you ever want to look through them. Um, and then feature options. These are just kind of extra things that you can enable in your class. There's a new quizzing tool that they're um, testing right now that we have access to. If you wanted to play around with that, you could do that. Um, there's just kind of a bunch of random features that you can turn on if you want to. Nothing, nothing that I'm like, oh, you definitely need to use that. But is is that where iClicker would come in if I'm using iClicker in class, brief polling? iClicker would probably be in apps. Let me okay. look. Yeah. That might even be something that you just need to have us help you get set up. Okay. But we do have it. I know I've I've used it with other people before, so I know that we there is a way to install it. Um, so if you have that, just let us know and we'll help you with it. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that is pretty much it. Sorry we went over. There's a lot. See, this is, I used to try and get migration into this training too. And I was just talking a million miles a minute. <laughs> and I feel like I already do that. Um, Feel free to stick around and ask questions. Uh, I'll stick around for a few minutes, um, but you're free to go as well. Thank you for coming. You guys were great. Uh, ask good questions and all that. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. Thanks.
if we want to see those some of those example courses like you showed us Debbie Dempsey's course and some of the other ones where can we see those in a way that we can't screw them up accidentally <laughs> I could add you as a student to that because hers especially is that she, I got permission from her to use it as a demo. Uh -huh. so I could, right. I could, so you have a demo version that we can see that does not interfere with any live class she's doing. Correct. I can add you as a student in that course if you want. Yeah, that'd be cool. The other ones I just show, I don't really have. They're, they're people I've worked with that I know wouldn't care, but I don't have like a demo version of their right. course. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, thank you. What's your? Yeah, I'm going to look Goddard. I'm just Goddard, G-O-D-D, G-O-D-D-A-R-D. That's it. I've been here since before email. So yeah, that's a, it's an heirloom email address. Yeah. yeah. Here we go. No initial, no number. Wow. Yeah, exactly. I, I used to have an initial. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Well, you should be added to that. You just have to accept the invitation and then you'll be able to see it. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Well, next one. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. See you then. Same time, same video. Yeah, exactly. All right. All right. And I believe uh, Tommy told me that he added that, like those workshop times to the training registration system. So you can, you can register for a time to come in if you want to do that. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh man, let's go find some for a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, bye. Where's your puppy? Bring your puppy in. He's here. Oh, He's been sleeping at my feet the whole time. He's been oh, really oh, good. Oh, to go to this training. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> He's all sleeping. <laughs> he earlier today during my other training he was scratching at my chair and I had to keep like pushing him like no leave me <laughs> but this time he just slept see you can barely see him because he's so dark but <laughs> he's sweet thank you Jessica thank you you guys have a good day All right. see you tomorrow yeah exactly or whoever's doing tomorrow yeah, yeah, I'm not going to history tomorrow.